Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. Guys, if you want to follow me on Instagram, go down to that description box, click on that Instagram link, give me a follow on Instagram, start to post some stuff over there, more about the lifestyle, but you know I'm always going to post stuff about getting to that financial freedom. So it's just another outlet for you to kind of see what I'm doing, keep up with me, I keep up with you, and we just keep rocking like that. So if you want to, get down to the description box, click on that Instagram link. Follow me at Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. Once again, if you're gonna follow me, guys, please click on the link in the description box. If you just go over to Instagram and type in Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor, who knows what might come up. A lot of scammers impersonate me over there. So just use the link down in the description box if you wanna follow me on Instagram. Like I said, I'm starting to do some stuff over there. I had a really big Instagram page last year, but it got uh, disabled by Instagram because of just a lot of weird uh, scammers and all that kind of stuff. So I had to start over from scratch. I hope you guys come over and follow me over there. And like I said, click on that link down in the description box. That's where you will find the Instagram link. Also, got the website coming out this Friday, hopefully. Um, still working on that, trying to get it to go live, tweaking some last little details on it. So hopefully the, the, the website, the Richard Fame Millionaire Mentor website will be going live on Friday. Um, I believe that's April. I don't even know what the date is. I think it's April 13th or something like that, 12th. But... Nevertheless, whatever Friday's date is, that's when I'm, I'm trying to get the website ready to go live. And like I said, the website is really going to be for you guys. It's going to be full of digital products and tools, financial tools to help you get to your financial freedom. So if you're interested in that, be on the lookout for that website. It's going to be the Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor website. Certainly, I'm going to have the link when it's ready to go live, I will have the link in the description box of the video when it's ready to go live. It's not live yet, so I don't have the link down there yet. But on Friday, I hope to have the link down there and I hope to talk about the website in uh, the live stream on Friday morning. So just be on the lookout for that. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a, 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 um, a membership component of it where we're going to be doing some special things for the members um, of the Richard Fane Millionaire uh, Mentor Club, for the lack of a better term for it. But, but it's going to be a lot of perks for you guys who, who become uh, members, right? Part of the membership game. That's what I like to call it, the membership game. So be on the lookout for that. That's coming real soon. If you want seven free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you seven free stocks. When you open a new Moomoo, brokerage account, you put $100 in your brokerage account, Moomoo is going to give you seven free stocks. Now, they won't be just any stocks. It'll be the Magnificent Seven. All you got to do is go down to the description box of this video, click on that Moomoo link, open up your new Moomoo account today, put $100 in it. They're going to give you seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. You guys, if you've been rocking with me, you know exactly who the Magnificent Seven is. If you don't know who they are, that would be Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Alphabet, Tesla, and NVIDIA. That's the Magnificent Seven. The top seven companies in the S&P 500. They're going to give you seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven when you open your new Moomoo brokerage account. So get down there in the description box. Open up that Moomoo account today. Y'all know that's my brokerage app of choice. That's the app that I'm going to use to buy my paper assets over the next 10 years. All big boy blue chip paper assets. Matter of fact, it's three of them, including the Magnificent Seven. So if you want to rock with me, you want to copy my plan, get down to the description box, click on that Moomoo link, 
and get yourself rolling. Get yourself seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. Well, all right, guys, let's move on to the topic we're going to be tackling today. And that's that topic of Americans running out of money very soon. Federal Reserve has went on record to say that the American people are running out of money. And I got some more data here to back that up. A, a, big, a big Wall Street firm did a survey of a bunch of Americans and asked them, how you doing? How you doing when it comes to your money game? How you doing when it comes to your savings game? How you doing when you come to your retirement savings game? And a lot of people are not doing well. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about some things you can do so that you're not caught up in that particular situation. So, yeah, that's a that's 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 a one that's that's really, really, really starting to rear its ugly head, guys, I, even though. The job market is really strong. That's the only money supply we have for most of us is our wages. There are no more money supplies for us. Personal savings is gone. You can't borrow money from the bank anymore because the interest rates are too high. So the only money supply you got right now is your wages. You got to ask yourself if something happens to my wages what am I going to do if I don't have any assets, if I don't have any reserves, if I don't have an emergency fund? What am I going to do if they take that money supply away from me? They've already taken two of the three money supplies away from you. Your personal savings is gone. You can't borrow money. So the only money supply you have left, guys, is your wages. They take that from you. What do you do? We're going to talk about that. We're going to also talk a little bit about one of your big boy, too big to fail banks. I'm talking about the number one bank in America, the fifth largest bank in the world. The CEO is saying be on the lookout for a recession, possibly. We talked about that yesterday. I keep telling y'all folks are on one side of the fence or the other when it comes to this recession thing. And again, I'm not trying to scare you and I'm not trying to say there will be one. I'm just telling you the largest bank in America, fifth largest bank in the world, the CEO is concerned. I mean, you might want to listen to this guy. One, he's a billionaire. Two, he's the CEO of the largest bank in America. Might want to listen to him, at least what he got to say. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's good information for us to, to, to go through. And then we're going to end the conversation. We're going to end the conversation with uh, Bitcoin, your daily dose of Bitcoin. But we're going to leave that for last because I think there's, a, there's something interesting going on right now with one of your largest Wall Street firms. I'm talking about one of your largest Wall Street firms who have a Bitcoin ETF. It's not good. It's not good. What's happening to that big bank? What's happening to that Wall Street firm and it's and it's Bitcoin ETF. We're going to talk about that. Shocking, shocking news, guys. So stick around for that. But let's start off with uh, the Fed and them saying that um, Americans are, are, are running out of money. Here's the headline. Americans will run. Here's the headline. Americans will likely run out of excess pandemic savings this year. Just telling you, that's, that's what the headline is. Americans will likely deplete the rest of their excess savings they accumulated during the pandemic, according to a new study from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Okay, let's, let's read about that. After rapidly accumulating unprecedented levels of excess savings during the pandemic, the San Francisco Fed estimates American households had less than $190 billion in aggregate savings. This was in June of last year. I'm talking about a year ago almost, right? You only had about $190 billion left. Here's the kicker, though. Excess savings peaked at 2.1 trillion in August of 21. 
far exceeding the projected trend line from before the pandemic. So, so pandemic, your savings accounts boomed, shot up to over $2 trillion right after the pandemic. Why? Because you got the free stimulus money. You got the PPP money. You got the unemployment. We were getting all this free money. You have access to cheap loans. Why? Interest rates were zero. Fed funds rate was zero. Today it's five and a half percent. See, so you had cheap money. Remember, we talked about the money supply, right? You got three sources of money supply, guys. You got what? Your savings and your assets. That's one money supply source. You got your wages. That's two money supply sources. Then you got your what? Cheap money you can borrow from banks. Loans. That's a money supply. So that's a money supply. You got three money supply sources, right? Right now, what do we got? We got one. But two years ago, you had $2 trillion in pandemic savings. $2 trillion. Now the Fed say you're down to about $190 billion. That was a year ago. They're predicted that that would even be gone in 2024. Gone. Done. Zero. So, so it's not something that we need to bury our head in the sand on, guys. We got to pay attention to this. However, American households begin to pull from those excess savings more rapidly starting in 2022. Averaging about $100 billion per month in drawdowns. Now, what in the world was Americans doing in 2022 drawing down $100 billion a month from their excess savings? What do y'all think we were doing with that money? What were we doing with it? Hopefully, some of y'all was pulling that money out of savings and putting it into assets. Because if you remember in 2022, what was happening with assets, specifically paper assets, they were crashing. So if you were smart, you'd have been pulling money out of your pandemic savings and you'd have been buying these blue chip big boy assets at a discount. I don't know how many of y'all did that, but that would have been what I would have been doing, right? But nevertheless, Americans were pulling out $100 billion a month out of their pandemic savings, a hundred billion a month. Now, here's what, well, well, we'll talk about that. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. We'll talk about what, what really Americans were doing with that money in a second, but let's keep moving. So they were taking a hundred billion per month in drawdowns and totaling 1.9 trillion as of June, 2023. 1.9 trillion, guys. That's, in, that's insane. 1.9 trillion. We start pulling down and we, we went from 200, we went from 2 trillion all the way down to 1. 190 billion in basically a year. Year and a half. Okay, let's say a year and a half. According to the study. If drawdowns continue at the same pace, excess savings will likely be depleted by the end of 2023, which clearly we're into 2024. We're a quarter into 2024. So basically, y'all got no personal savings is what they're saying. It's depleted, done, kaput. And that's true. And we're going we're gonna to double back in a second and tell you why that's true from this other study that was did, done by this Wall Street investment firm. Matter of fact, it was Goldman Sachs, Wall Street investment firm, right? They did a survey already to, to kind of back up what the Fed is saying here, right? Which ends in September, the San Francisco Fed found. Now that's the San Francisco Fed. A lot of y'all, oh, that's not the Fed, that is the Fed. That's part of the Federal Reserve, the San Francisco Fed. So you gotta understand these different regions you got Fed, you got, you got, like you got the San Francisco Fed, you got the Atlanta Fed, you got the New York Fed, right? You got Feds, kind of, you know, Fed hubs all around the United States, right? And, and some of them do research. And this San Francisco Fed did, a re, did research. They did a study. And this is what they found. 
This is exactly what they found. The rapid accumulation and subsequent drawdown of the excess savings following the onset of the pandemic recession contrasts starkly with, starkly with prior recessions. The chief economist of Moody's Analytics said Thursday he is doubtful excess savings will be depleted this quarter. And they were talking about the end of 2023, but he was wrong. He said that Moody's estimated excess savings will end the quarter at $1 trillion. Well, here's the deal, guys. It's gone. It's gone. Excess savings is gone. It's gone. So let's move on and, and let's, let's back that up with exactly what I told you. We're going to back it up with the study from Goldman Sachs. Here's the headline from the study from Goldman Sachs. 61% of Americans will run out of emergency savings by the end of the year. That's 24. Here's how to reduce expenses now. So here is the problem. You're running out of money. Here is the solution. How to reduce expenses and make more money. You're running out of money. You got no more money. No more savings. That's the problem. Here comes the solution. Now, some of us will listen to the solution. Some of us won't. I've identified the problem for you, and y'all know I ain't lying. Y'all know many of y'all do not have no personal savings. We've already talked about in prior live streams where you got half of Americans don't even have $1,000 in savings for emergency. So if their car broke down, they couldn't even get it fixed. That's 50% that's of Americans. Here they're telling you 61% of Americans will run out of emergency savings by year end. But they're also giving you some, some, some solutions, how, how to fix that. That's the part of the video uh, or the part of the title where I say, do this now. Th that's what that means. This is what you should be doing, what we're finna get ready to go through. What we're finna get ready to go through. This is what you should be doing. Emergency savings can help you out if unexpected expenses arise. But the pandemic has caused the majority of Americans to dip into their rainy day fund. We just talked about that right in the first part of the segment, right? We talked about the two trillion. We talked about that. We talked about that as one of the three money supplies, right? And these folks are backing that up. They're backing that up saying the pandemic has caused the majority of Americans to dip into their rainy day funds with many Expect it to deplete them. Deplete it. Deplete their emergency fund, which many of us have. Roughly three in five Americans say their emergency savings won't last through the end of the year or that they have already run out of savings. Three out of five people that they surveyed, this Goldman Sachs survey, three out of five people said either they're going to run out this year or it's already gone. I'm not making this stuff up, guys. This is what the real world we live in. Oh, that ain't me. I'm, I'm good. I got, I got $1,500 in my savings. I'm great. Okay, maybe you are. That's one person. But we're talking about the whole United States. We're not just talking about you. We're talking about the whole United States when you look at the whole country. Three out of five say either they're going to be zero by the end of the year or they're already zero. That's what we're saying here, guys. But we got to come up with some solutions to help folks to, to, to right size this and get this thing right. So roughly three in five Americans, 61% of Americans, guys, that's 61% of Americans say their emergency savings won't last through the end of the year and they have already run out of savings according to the September installment of the Pandemic Financial Impact Series. That's an alarming number, especially since only 18.1% 18, 18 of Americans say they won't run out of emergency savings. 18% say they won't. Guess who that is? That's probably the 1%. That's probably the 1%. 18% of Americans say they won't run out of money. That's probably the 1%. Okay, let's get to some solutions. We already know the problem. The problem is what? Americans are running out of money. 
They are. That money supply from personal savings has dried up. So that's one money supply they don't have. Second money supply they don't have is cheap money to borrow from banks because interest rates too high. Can't borrow no money. Plus a lot of us don't let our credit deteriorate because we late on bills. That's another thing. 30, 40% of Americans are late on some type of bill, whether it be credit card, car loan, home loan, personal loan, line of credit, they're late. 30 to 40% of Americans are late on something. So a lot of us have let our personal credit deteriorate. So our credit score is taking a, a dive, right? Because that's typically what happens, right? When we cut off, our, when we don't have savings, we don't have cheap money to borrow. The only thing we got from a money supply standpoint is our wages. What happens? We got to take those wages and we have to prioritize what we pay, right? Most of us are going to prioritize food, shelter, and probably pay for gas for transportation. So the credit card bill, uh, the Macy's bill, uh, the Costco bill, all of them, the little credit cards you got, little stuff like that. Oh, uh, uh, the little furniture that I got a year ago that I, you know, they gave me, you know, 12 months, 18 months, no interest. That's coming due. All that stuff, I'm going to pay late because I'm going to take care of food. I'm going to take care of shelter and I'm going to take care of gas for my car. All that other stuff, they're going to be late. So guess what? That's what's happening. So guess what? Personal credit scores are starting to plummet because people are 30 days late. They 60 days late. They 90 days late. Remember, I told you a couple weeks ago, um, there are 1 million mortgages that are 90 days late. Guys, that, that, when you go 90 days late, that, that's a serious delinquency. 30 days late, okay. I, I, I fell behind. Let me get caught up. But when you 90 days late on something, that tells me you just don't got the money to pay these people. Right? So, 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 so let's, let's, we've identified the problem. Let's come up with some solutions. How do we, how do we right size this? How do, how to reduce expenses and build an emergency fund? Let, let, let's see what these people got to say. Reducing expenses is key to building an emergency fund, but the first step is deciding what amount of money you can affordably save each month. See, under my opinion, now they may differ with me, but my opinion is you need three to six months of your expenses. That's your emergency fund, three to six months. So if my expenses are 2,000 a month, minimum I need six grand tucked away and then and, and obviously all the way up to 12 grand, depending upon where I fall in that three to six months, right? But that's what I need typically. Let's see what these folks, since they're calling themselves experts, let's see what they say. Experts typically recommend you have an emergency fund with three to six months. Oh, goodness gracious, where did I get that from? Did I read that before I, no, I didn't read that before I told y'all that. I already knew that. Y'all know I've been saying three to six months for four years. Boom, they're in agreement with me though. So the experts are in agreement with me. I'm not an expert, but these guys at Goldman Sachs, they are experts. I'm not the expert, but they agree with me. I agree with them. Experts typically recommend you have an emergency fund with about three to six months worth of your living expenses. Right? I just said that. But amid times of financial hardship, like the pandemic, that threshold may be out of reach for people living paycheck to paycheck, which is true, right? A lot of people, a lot of people would love to have a three to six month emergency fund, guys, but let's be honest. You got one money supply. You, that's it. You got one money supply. You got no savings. You got no access to cheap money through loans. All the thing you got access to are your wages, and your wages are what your wages are. Whatever your skill set is, whatever value you add to the marketplace, that's what you're compensated for. So if you add $30,000 worth of value to the marketplace, that's what they pay you. If you add $100,000 to the marketplace, that's what they pay you. 
See, the marketplace is a doggy dog world, guys. You, they, just because you think you should be making 100 k if the marketplace don't agree with that, they're not going to pay you that. They don't care what you think. So my recommendation to people is if you find yourself in a situation where you can't save money, you can't tuck away money for an emergency fund, you got an income problem or you got a spending problem. It's one of those two things. You got an income problem or you got a spending problem. Good news is you can fix those two things. Now, if I got an income problem, that basically means I got to increase my income. I got to increase my value to the marketplace. Therefore, the marketplace will pay me more money. I can't be a $30,000 a year guy with a $30,000 skill set thinking I should be getting 60. It don't work that way, guys. They don't care what you think. It's what your, your value is. So if you think you're a $60,000 guy or gal and only getting paid 30, guess what? Increase your skill set. Go to whoever you need to go to and say, no, guys, y'all got me down here as a $30,000 guy, but I'm really a $60,000 guy. And here's why. And if they say, no, we don't agree with you, then take that to another company and show them the same thing. One of those companies may believe you and they may pay you 60 k but you got to increase your income. That's one solution. Second solution is you sit down and you take a look at your, your expenses. What are you spending your money on? And here's a little quick pro tip. The only thing you should be spending money on, guys, things that are necessary to live. Netflix ain't necessary to live. Amazon Prime ain't necessary to live. Going out to restaurants is not necessary to live. You going out partying and having a good time because you think you deserve it is not a, a, a essential to life. You getting your hair done, your nails done, your toenails done, uh, your bikini wax, uh, your, your, your massages, uh, all this other stuff, your golf trips, none of that's essential to life. None of it. You will not suffer if you don't do any of that stuff. What's essential to life is you putting food in your, your, your system, in your body, having a roof over your head, reasonable roof over your head, not some Mac daddy apartment that's costing you $3,000 a month and you only making $5,000 a month. No, not that. That's not essential. It needs to be essential to life. This is what these people are going to tell you, these experts. I'm going to read it, but this is what the experts are going to tell you. I'm telling you what they're going to tell you. You need to look at your budget and cut out all wants. Only thing you should have in that budget is needs, real needs. And none of that stuff I told you guys, those are not needs. You getting your hair done is not a need. You getting a massage is not a need. You going out to restaurants and spending $500 a month is not a need. You going out to your local watering hole with your buddies or your girlfriends and having a couple uh, uh, martinis is not a need. You driving around in an $800 a month car payment car is not a need. It's not. It's not a need. Those are all wants. You have to get rid of the wants and stick to needs and then you will be in a position where you can get, save yourself and get your emergency fund. Let's keep reading. Let's see what the experts say. If your income has decreased, you likely won't be able to save a lot of money. I just said that, right? I just said that. Remember I told you, whatever your, whatever your value you bring to the marketplace, that's what they're going to pay you for. See, if I'm a $100,000 a year value guy, I ain't got to worry about somebody trying to pay me 30. But if I'm a $30,000 a year guy, that's my skill set. I'm $30,000 a year skill set. Unless I increase that skill set, guys, I don't get to 100. I don't. I never get there unless I increase the skill set. I got to increase and add more value to the marketplace. Right? If your income has decreased, you likely won't be able to save a lot of money, especially if you have outstanding loan or credit card balances. Some experts suggest you adjust the amount you save based on your current income. So if your income dropped by 30%, reduce your monthly savings by 
And if you have debt, some experts recommend you have a minimum amount, 500 to 1,000 before paying off debts so you have some savings. Here, 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 here's my recommendation to you. I'm going to take care of my needs first. I don't care what I got over here. They're going to have to get in the line. Now, if I'm in a, my back against the wall, my back against the wall, I got nowhere to turn. I just got my income from the job. I'm doing my very, very best to, 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 to take that income. I, I'm trying to sit, I'm trying to cut out expenses, but I'm still falling short. And I know it's going to take me 30, 60, 90 days to get, my, get me, get me some, uh, uh, some side hustle, some additional money in. I'm going to take care of my needs. My needs come first. I pick up the phone. I call my credit card company. Hey, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Credit Card Company. I'm, I'm going through a tough one. I'm going to get you paid, but it's going to be a little late. I'm just t telling you right up front. Uh, hello, uh, credit union. I know I got that person along with you. I know I'm a little late, but I'm going to get you paid. It's just going to take a minute. I'm going to take care of my needs first, and then I'm going to work on all this debt. I'm not going to pay my credit card bill if I, can't, I ain't got food to put on the table to feed my kids. That's not going to happen. I'm just keeping it 100 with you. I don't care how much money I got. If I'm broke tomorrow and I got $10,000 left and it's $10,000 I can get at American Express, they ain't getting it. Now, I'm going to be a man and I'm going to say, hey, American Express, we're going to get you right. You, you ain't going to get it today. Let me get my skill set up. Let me get me some side hustles. Let me get back on my feet and then I'm going to get you right sized. That's what I would do. Because I get people all the time, well, I got, I got, I got 10000 in credit card debt and I got 15000 in my savings. Should I take the... Say, listen, man, you do whatever you want to do, but, but, but hear me clearly. If you're already late with that credit card company, if you're already in a derogatory status, I don't care how much you pay them. You're going, you're going to stay in a derogatory status. That's how it is. Once you're late, you're late. So if you're already charged off, you charged off. You just got to know to get yourself right financially so you don't have to go through that again. But I'm not going to take my last and, and give it to somebody over here that's already, they already got billions and billions of dollars. So I don't get three points on my credit score dinged. No, I'm going to take care of what I got to take care of on my needs first. Once I get my needs taken care of, my job then is to increase my skill set to make more money. My job then is to create some side hustles. Right. I've gotten myself in this trouble because I, my behavior with money is not good. I got a raggedy behavior with money. If I'm over here with all this debt, no savings, that's not the right way, guys. We got to get out of that. Right. And all I'm telling you is pay your bills, pay your creditors. But but by no means should they come before your basic needs to live. I'm not talking about going out to eat. I'm not talking about all this extra stuff you be trying to do and not pay your bills. No, I'm talking about if I got $500 in the bank and I know I need to go grocery shopping to put some food in the house in the refrigerator for my kids, then I'm going grocery shopping. If I got something left, then I'll pay a little bit to my bill. But, but, but now what do I got to do? I got to get me some more money in. I got to get on my feet. I got to do better. And then I got to learn to stay out of debt. When especially when I don't have any savings to help me get out of that debt. So that's all I'm saying. So let's move on. Keep your emergency funds in a relatively accessible amount, such as high yield savings, you know, and of course, they're going to plug their little account, which I'm not going to name on here, but they plug their little account, <laughs> which I get it. They did the article, so they plugged it. But yeah, you want to put that emergency fund three to six months, guys, you want to put that in a savings account somewhere. Preferably a high yield money market, high yield savings account where you're earning a little bit of money, a little bit of interest on it. But you don't want to co-mingle it with your checking account, your everyday operating account. You don't want to co-mingle it with that. Right. You don't want to co-mingle it with that. You want to keep it separate from that. Right. Because, again, it's for emergencies. Oh, I broke a nail and I need to get an emergency nail fix for one hundred dollars. <laughs> But I, ain't, I don't get paid till next week. Let me take it out the emergency fund. No, that's not an emergency. You breaking a nail. That's not an emergency. That's not an emergency. Come on now. See, this is the stuff we do. 
It's not an emergency. So, so please, don't, don't worry about that. To increase the amount of money you put towards an emergency fund, review your bank statements and identify areas where you can cut costs. Here are some helpful tips. So create a budget. Isn't that one of the four financial principles we talk about all the time? Live on less than what you make. We just, just talked about that one. The second one is what? Live on a plan, which is a personal budget. That's the second principle in our four principles to get to financial freedom. That's the second one. So they're saying create a budget. Then they're saying cut costs. Yeah, you should be cutting costs. You should be finding ways to, 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 to cut costs, right? Remember we talked about all oh, this going out to eat crap, guys? No, no, you gotta, you gotta stop that. When you don't have an emergency fund, when you got credit card debt and all that, there's no reason, you, you shouldn't be going anywhere. You shouldn't be taking no trips. You shouldn't be buying no extra clothes. You shouldn't be doing no lottery tickets. You shouldn't be doing nothing other than getting yourself, cutting all that. You shouldn't have no streaming services. Nothing. You shouldn't be going golfing. You shouldn't be going to the movies. You shouldn't be doing any of that if you don't have an emergency fund. You shouldn't be doing any of that. You shouldn't be doing any of that if you don't have retirement savings. If you don't have assets, you shouldn't be doing any of that. If you got all this high interest rate credit card debt, high interest rate car loan debt, you shouldn't be doing any extras, no pleasures, no pleasure in yourself. None of that stuff, guys. That's what they mean by cutting costs. Now, they're going to have all kind of fancy mumbo jumbo in here. But at the end of the day, that's what they're basically saying. You shouldn't be doing any of that. So I'm going to give it to you real. Oh, everybody deserves a break. No, you don't. You deserve a break when you get yourself financially in shape. That's when you get a break. You get a break when you get your financial house in order. See, that's the problem with us. We think we need a break even though we got a raggedy situation with our money. We still want a break. We still want a trip. We still want a fancy dinner. We still want to go buy a nice outfit. Raggedy behavior with money. Drowning in credit card debt. But we still want to break. We still want to treat ourselves. We think we deserve it. See, that's the trap. I keep telling y'all, that's the trap. Consider new ways to make money. Here's the side hustles, right? Remember I told you, you got to increase the skill set. These folks saying the same exact thing I just said. Right? Same exact thing. Beyond cutting costs, consider any monetizable skills you have. Monetizable skills. If you're artsy, you may want to consider making items that can be sold on Etsy. Sounds like a good one to me. If you're good with kids, you can take up babysitting. See, a lot of us think we're beyond that though. Oh, I got a PhD. What I'm babysitting for? Oh, I got a PhD. I ain't selling nothing on Etsy. I got a PhD. I got a master's degree. I went to Harvard. I went to Princeton. I went to Howard. <sighs> My sorority sisters can't find me on no Etsy. They can't, I can't, they can't, I can't let them know I'm babysitting. Okay, stay broke. Stay broke. Go ahead and let pride keep you broke. One of the three, three killers of financial freedom is one of them is pride. Keep letting pride, keep that pride going. You're going to stay exactly the financial situation you're in. Right? Other side hustles include tutoring. What if you're a teacher? I mentioned this. All our wonderful teachers out there. If you're struggling, guys, if you're a teacher and you're still struggling to make ends meet, tutoring is a wonderful side hustle. You already love kids. You already love people. You already love educating. Tutor. That's a natural for some of our wonderful teachers that are out there. Go ahead and be, be, start your little tutorial service on the side. A little side hustle. Put a little money in your pocket, right? Other side hustles include tutoring, even walking dogs. Some of you are animal lovers. Love animals. Why not take that passion for animals and turn it and monetize it? Turn it into an income stream. Hey, if you love animals, that's perfect. Monetize it. 
See, that's what I keep telling y'all, guys. All of us are good at something. We're all good at something. Just monetize what you're good at. Oh, I love animals, but I don't know how to do that. It's pretty easy. Put an ad on Facebook Marketplace and tell people, hey, I love animals. If you're busy, I'll be more than happy to come by and walk your dog, feed your dog, babysit your dog, whatever. And here's, my, here's what I charge. I love animals and I have a lot of free time and I, I boop. You think people won't do that? People would love for someone to come in to their home while they're gone for two weeks and just care for their animals. And you can charge them for it. A lot of people don't want to take their pets to kennels. And ain't nothing wrong with kennels. They're great too. That's a great resource. But I'm saying some people would pay you to come to their home, live in their home for two weeks a month to take care of their pets. That's how we feel about pets in this country. And they will pay you big dollars to do it. So all this, oh, I don't got no side hustles. I don't know what to do. The problem is a lot of us want to do what we want to do. We don't want to do what's necessary. We done got past that. We don't, uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't want to do that. I'm above that. No, they paying five, six, seven thousand dollars a month. You could be adding to your little, your little, your, 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 your income for something you love doing. So I don't know. I'm just telling you what 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 these people are suggesting. I agree with them 100 percent. Right. You can list your services on social media. I just said that. I just said you can go right on Facebook Marketplace and do whatever you want to do for free <laughs> for free. Right. It says right here, you can list your services on social media or through sites like TaskRabbit and Care.com. For free. The extra money you bring in can put towards your emergency fund. See, yeah, baby, we talk about, oh, I don't know what to do. There ain't nothing to do. Guys, there are plenty of things out there we can do. Everybody is good at something. Whatever you're good at, just monetize it. Oh, I'm good at playing chess. Monetize it. I'm good at watching soap operas. Monetize it. You think there ain't other people out there that like soap operas that would love a play-by-play? -play? You get on YouTube, tell people about your soap operas and what you think about it. And listen here, man. There are YouTube channels out there right now that let's take Game of Thrones. Let's take... Um, uh, what's the other show that I like on Netflix that's based out of the UK? Uh, Top Boy. Let's take Top Boy. Let's take uh, Game of Thrones. Any of them shows, you got guys on, and gals on YouTube that all they do is give you their opinion on what happened in these shows. And they make hundreds of thousands of views. Hundreds of thousands of views. They watch the show, just like you do. <laughs> they just watch the show. But here's the difference. They monetize. You don't. You sit up here and watch three, four, five hours of TV and just be a couch potato eating potato chips and Cheetos and don't monetize nothing. These folks do the same thing you do, but they monetize it. And they just tell what their opinion is. Come on, guys, this is ridiculous, man, how easy it is to make money in this country, but we just make it hard for some reason. I don't know why. Bottom line, taking a look at your finances and finding ways to reduce costs can help you find areas to save for an emergency. The sooner you start saving, the more money you'll have in the long run for any unexpected expenses that may arise. Just remember, nothing happens overnight. Oh, goodness gracious. Have y'all heard me say that before? I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, I think I have said that. It don't happen overnight. You don't roll out of bed one morning and poof, you're a millionaire. Nope. It takes a little time. It takes some patience. You'll need to stick to your budget and be creative with it to build your emergency fund. I'm going to go a step further. You take the same principles we just talked about, the same principles, and you relay it to financial freedom. You don't stop at the emergency fund. That's the short-term goal. See, the emergency fund is the short-term goal. Once you get past the emergency fund, you should be going towards the long-term goal, which is financial freedom. The short-term goal is let me right-size myself, get my budget in order, get my money game up, get my uh, emergency fund right, and then the long-term is I got to get to freedom. I got to get to my financial freedom. That's the long game. 
And guess what, guys? You use the same financial principles to do that. No different. Same financial principles. Live on less than what you make. Live on a plan. Stay out of consumer debt. Save and invest. That's all you need to do month after month, year after year, decade after decade if necessary. And you get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Just saying, guys, this is what I keep telling y'all. We got to focus on that. We cannot focus on things. We got to focus on freedom. And that's where we fall short in this country. That's why 61% or three out of five people ain't got no money. Because see, we focus on things in this country. We don't focus on freedom. That's why we take $2 trillion in pandemic savings all the way down to basically zero. Basically zero. Two years. That's all it took us to do. Two years. So what did we do with that money? A lot of y'all might ask, well, Richard, what? I mean, I still got my pandemic savings. Well, that's good for you. But most people don't. I just read you all the information you needed, not from me, Federal Reserve, and from Goldman Sachs, their survey. This ain't coming from me. This is coming from Federal Reserve and Goldman Sachs. Right? Two big boy outfits. Two big boy outfits. Not just out of my mind. Oh, Richard, you're making this stuff up. No, I'm not. Gave it to you. Black and white. So what did we spend the money on? Somebody help me out here. What did we spend the money on? Trips, pleasuring ourselves, buying cars, buying homes that we don't really need, going out to eat, excess traveling, luxury handbags, luxury goods, designer clothes, designer shoes. Spa treatments. Just all kind of crap. We just spend it on crap that ain't going to put not one, not one, not one, ain't going to generate not one cent of passive income. That's what we spend it on. Everything we spend it on ain't going to generate one cent of passive, passive income. None. That's where the $2 trillion went. The $2 trillion went back into our economy to the 1% through y'all buying things. Because you do know all of that stuff I mentioned, who owns it? You don't own it. I don't own it. Who owns it? The 1% own it. So the 1% pump all of this money into, our, into your pockets. This is how the 1% got y'all. They pump all the money into your pockets. And then they know you're going to turn around and put it right back in their pocket. So this is what they say. They said, listen, go ahead and give them the stimulus check. Go ahead and give them the unemployment check. Go ahead and give them the PPP. They're going to turn around and give it right back to us anyways. And guess what we did? We did exactly what they said we were going to do. See, they know us because they know we're a country of spenders, not savers. They know we are a country of people who, who put priority on things instead of freedom. They know that. See, the 1% know that about the majority of us. What they don't want you to know is how to change it. See, they don't want you to know anything about living on less than what you make. They don't want you to know anything about, oh, you can sit down and put together a budget and eliminate the wants and only keep the needs. See, they don't want you in that mind frame because it jeopardizes their luxurious lifestyles that they lead. They want to keep you in the dark. That's why when you in grade school, middle school, high school, college, all the way up to your PhD, they don't teach you anything about building wealth. But they teach you everything how to, about how to get a job. Yeah. You ever notice that? You, they teach you nothing about 
building real wealth and passing on that wealth. They don't teach you that. They teach you how to get a job. They, keep, they teach you how to get on. The, okay, Richard, this is how you properly get on the hamster wheel. Nope, you can't put that leg first. You got to actually put your arm up there first to brace yourself. So when you get on the hamster wheel, you got to get comfortable because you're going to be on that sucker for 25 to 50 years. Yeah, they'll walk you through that process very carefully. Okay, Richard, this is how you get on the hamster wheel because, buddy, buckle in because you're going to be on there for 50 years. <laughs> Y'all be like, okay, sign me up. Sign me up. Sign me up. I get me a Gucci handbag. Sign me up. What? You mean that get on the back of Jordan tennis shoes? I sign me up. You mean I can go get my hair done, get me a little fresh do? And we fall right in the trap, get right on the dam. We, we exchange our freedom. We exchange our freedom for things. And they happily take it. It's a, it's a great change. It's a great swap for the 1%. You mean to tell me, okay, I give you a little bit of money. Right, yeah, you can go buy your, 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 your BMW, you can, you can front and, and, and try to keep up with the Joneses and let pride, see, pride is going to keep them on the treadmill, guys. We don't have to do anything but just show them commercials, get them caught up in the social media. Y'all think they created social media for y'all. They created social media to trap you. Social media is a trap. They, 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 see, they knew they had to evolve. We can't just get them on the TV no more. They don't got smart guys. They don't, they don't, they can't get them on the TV, just on the TV. You got to get them with the social media because that's where they're at. See, they can't take the, 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 the 85 inch big screen TV to work with them. <laughs> so they can't watch TV at work because they can't take the big screen TV with them to work. But guess what? Let's get them on these things. They can take this to work with them. See, we know, right, four out of nine hours, they're strolling through their phone when they're at work. So that's what they did. They tricked y'all. They tricked all of us. And they got all of us on these things. Now we're addicted to these things. We're addicted to these things and we're worse. We are worse off with these things than we were before they came out. We're worse off. We're, we're broker. I guarantee you 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we had more money and savings than we have today because of this thing. This thing right here is why three out of five Americans done ran out of money. This thing right here. Yes, sir. Now, I'm not knocking the innovation. I think it has some good merits to it, but it also has some bad merits to it, right? Because what do we do all day? All day, this is what we do. Whether it be all the social media platforms, and what are we doing when we do that most of the time? We're envying someone else's lifestyle. That's what we're doing most of the time. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Oh, golly. Oh, and he, oh, he's so nice to her. Oh, look at the roses he sent her. Why don't my guy send me roses? Oh, oh, golly. Look at that trip he took her on. Why is my guy not taking me on a trip? Same thing for men. Oh, golly. Oh, man. She showed treating him nice. Why my girl don't treat me that? See, this is what we do, though. Oh, my God. You mean to tell me oh my, he got a Rolls Royce Phantom? He got a, he got a, he got a Ferrari? He got a Lambo, too? And all I got to do is send him $1,500 and he'll help me get all that stuff, too? There you go. That's how we fall in the trap. That's how we fall in the trap. Just telling you the truth. Y'all know I ain't lying. Y'all know I ain't lying. This is what we do, though. This is what we do, and this is why three out of five Americans going no savings, nothing. That's how we go from two trillion two years ago to basically a nothing burger today in savings. That's how we did it. Just like that. Just like that. Things over freedom. We got to change that. And you got an option today to change that. You, you can change that. And I know many of you have, because I know many of you have been rocking with me for a long time. 
and you've heard me say this over and over and over, which I, I'm going to say it over and over and over. That, this is the whole point of my YouTube channel. This is it. My whole point is to help you get to freedom. Now, if you don't want that, you get the wrong channel. Right? You know that. I don't, I don't you know. And, and again, you know, we, we're going to be in the chat with all this goofy stuff about Biden and Trump and all. Guys, listen, man. Dumb people ain't got nothing to do with the, with the situation you're in right now. See, this is another thing about us. We always want to blame somebody else for the plight we find ourselves in. Don't we? Don't we always want to blame somebody? <laughs> we'll never take ownership of the crazy, raggedy financial decisions we've made. We always want to blame somebody else for it. Oh, it was Joe Biden's fault. Oh, it was Trump's fault. Oh, it was the Democrats. Oh, it was the Republicans. Oh, it's because they, you know, they got, they got, they got affirmative action. Uh, they don't have affirmative action. Oh, they, 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 they've, they've always held back from us. They, they've never let us pro. It's always an excuse. We never just take ownership of our own crap. The financial condition you're in today, you caused it. Nobody else. That's the first step in changing your mindset, guys. Your first step in changing your mindset is to admit it's your fault. Nobody, nobody forced you to spend your money on things you didn't need to spend it on. You did that. I live in the same country as you. I just got a different mindset. I just got a different way of doing things when it comes to my financial life. Nobody held me back. Nobody knocked on my door and said, hey, you, 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 you can't do this because of the color of your skin. You can't do this because uh, you don't have a high enough education. You can't do this because whatever we want to come up with to make excuses when we don't succeed financially. We always got to make some excuse, right? It's never our fault. It's never my fault. It ain't my fault. I did everything I was supposed to do. It ain't my fault. I can't help because they changed the laws. I can't help because they won't let you do it. All crap, all excuses, right? We live in the greatest country in the world. If you want to build financial freedom and get to wealth, get there. Nobody's stopping you. Ain't nobody in your way. Stop making excuses. Oh, it's Biden. It's Bidenomics. It's Trump. It's this. It's that. No people ain't got nothing to do with you, man. They don't know you. They don't want to know you. They'll never know you. They don't care about you. But why you care about them when they don't care about you? Somebody please help me with that. Why would we care about people like that that don't care about us? Why would I spend my time worried about Joe Biden or, 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 or Donald Trump? Why would I worry about those folks when they ain't worried about me? How about I worry about me? How about I control what I can control? If my situation financially is raggedy, it's my fault. That's where it starts. And it's up to me to get myself out of that. There's no government. There's no entity. There's no person that can save me. I got to save me. That's the first step. They've already told you three out of five Americans are running out of money or don't have any money left in savings. The likelihood, a good likelihood, three out of every five people that are watching this live stream right now ain't got no money in savings or they're running out of savings. That's the statistics. So three out of five of y'all in here fit this profile. The question is, what are you going to do? We've talked about the problem, but we also talked about solutions. My recommendation is focus on these solutions. Try to get something out of this. Try to get something out of this. Last thing we're going to cover and we're going to get out of here is we're going to go to J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, largest bank in America. He's warning of 8% interest rates along with inflation. Now, we talked about inflation yesterday and we covered it in depth. So I'm not going to jump into too much of this, but I did want you guys to understand that at the highest level, 
You're talking about Jamie Dimon, who's a billionaire. And he runs the largest bank in the United States, the fifth largest bank in the world. He's telling you exactly what I've been telling you. Prepare for a rainy day. Prepare for the worst, but expect the best. Not that a recession is coming, but you better prepare like one is coming because we don't know. We can't control that, but we can control our preparation. So that's the reason I wanted to mention this to you guys. That's the reason I wanted to mention because I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. So here are some key facts. The odds of a Goldilocks soft landing outcome for the economy are a lot lower than the consensus of 70% to 80% likelihood Jamie Dimon outlined in his annual letter to JP Morgan shareholders. See, he's talking to his shareholders. And what is he telling the shareholders? Be prepared, shareholders. There may not be a soft landing. There may not be a scenario where interest rates can come down and the economy can continue at an even keel. There may not be a soft landing, right? We may not be able to get inflation down and keep the economy exactly robust and doing what it's doing. Not that we won't, but he's saying there's an opportunity that we can't. So that's what he's saying to his shareholders, the people who own his bank, that be the shareholders, right? Here's another key fact that he said in that letter. Coupled with Diamond's concerns about the potential for stagflation, all you got to do is go to the Trillion Dollar Research Lab and look that up, stagflation. It'll tell you what it is. I don't have time today to be going into that. But go to the Trillion Dollar Research Lab and type in the search bar stag, stag, stagnation and you'll figure out what that is. Stagflation, I'm sorry, stagflation. A recession characterized by lingering high inflation, he warned interest rates could soar to 8% or even more. A far cry from the already 22-year high rates over 5% and going against conventional wisdom of a looming decline in rates, U.S. interest rates have, been, have not been 8% or higher since 1990. So this guy is saying, forget the 5.5 Fed funds rate, it could go all the way to 8%. I mean, the guy's a billionaire. He, he leads the largest bank in the United States, fifth largest bank in the world. So I, I, I can't just dismiss this guy and say he's a nutcase. How can you? The guy's credible. He's really, really credible. You, you, you can't just say, oh, this guy is cuckoo. He's cuckoo. No, you can't say that, guys. Jamie, it's Jamie Diamond, big boy, heavyweight. So you can't just say this guy is off his rocker. He's saying this because he knows something we don't know. Now, he's not saying unequivocally it will do that, but he's saying prepare. He's telling his shareholders, prepare, be ready, just in case. That's what I've been telling you guys. Prepare. Prepare for the worst, expect the best. Diamond explained there are several persistent inflationary pressures which could keep price increases sticky, including the rise in military conflict globally and the lingering effects of aggressive policy from central banks worldwide coming out of the pandemic. So there is some, there is some military conflict globally. We, we, we kind of know what that is. Right? You know, you got the Ukraine, you got the Russia thing. You know, there's always tension with, with, with all parts of the world, right? Always. There's always something going on in the world where people don't like each other and, they, and, and, they, and they're not afraid to go to war over it, right? There's always that somewhere in the world and it affects the global world if the players are big enough. Now, they don't even have to be really big players who are actually in the conflict. But if you have other big players that want to come support the little player in the conflict, it becomes a global conflict. So if you got the United States want to go support somebody and then some other big old gigantic power, power five nation <laughs> wants to support the other side, that's where the conflict comes in. Right. 
The billionaire diamond also warned about the potential for carnage for both equity and debt investors should a higher rate scenario play out, noting stock valuations are already at their high end and credit conditions are extremely tight. Just saying, just saying, you better be looking out. Credit conditions are tight. That's right. It, it's harder and harder to get a loan because banks are starting to tighten up. They're starting to tighten up because they're thinking, hey, with these interest rates as high as they are, it'll be really easy for a loan portfolio to go sideways. So we better tighten up our, our lending guidelines. We better start putting money aside for loan loss reserves just in case this, this loan portfolio starts to slide on us because we know as interest rates, if they go higher and stay higher for longer, there is going to be a really, really, really big increase in defaults. People are going to start defaulting on these loans. Because at some point, these higher interest rates are going to affect companies. And these companies are going to have to lay people off at some point. Now, it's not doing that now because we got this robust labor market. But if they go to 8% like this guy is saying potentially could happen, there are going to be some layoffs. And with layoffs comes what? People's ability to pay loan payments. That's what happens. So that's all he's saying. You know, extremely tightening conditions in the credit markets. Coupled with you already got super high valuations on stocks. And that's due to anticipation. Because typically when rates are this high, stocks shouldn't be doing what they're doing. But they're doing this because of anticipation of the Fed reducing rates. So now this guy is going the opposite way, saying, eh, they may not reduce. They may have to go up. And if that's the case, will those evaluations hold? They probably won't. As soon as the anticipation goes away, the FOMO goes away, stocks come down. Right now, FOMO is holding up stocks and it's holding up crypto. But if you take the FOMO away with these high rates, stocks and crypto will come down. Not a bad thing for investors who are in the building stage of wealth because now we can buy these assets at a dirt cheap discount, which is amazing. So not bad for us as investors. We want to buy them dirt cheap. We want to buy them at a discount if we can and then hold them until they go back to the moon. AKA 2022. Market traded at a negative all year. The smart investors gobbled up as much as they could gobble up. I was one of those investors. Gobbled up as much as I could gobble up. 23 rolled around. Last two months of 23, we go to the moon. I make a lot of money. So not a bad situation, guys, if we have a period of correction in the stock market. I keep telling y'all that. We're at all time highs, but I'm not going to sit around and wait for that period of correction. It may never happen. So I got to be in the market 365 days a year. I don't know when it goes to the moon. I don't know if there'll be a period of correction. Maybe it won't come. Maybe J J J uh, Jamie Dimon is wrong. Maybe the Fed reduces interest rates by a full 1% this year. We don't know. I don't control that. They don't, uh, uh, Jerome Powell don't call me up and say, hey, 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 bud, uh, just want to let you know, we're getting ready to reduce these things in June. So get yourself ready. How's the family? Oh, family's great, Jamie. Thank you for the, for the tip. Let me, let me, let me go make some money. Okay, buddy. Appreciate you. See you at the Christmas party. Click. I don't get that phone call from Jamie Diamond. So I, I, I don't get that phone call from J Jerome Powell. I don't get that phone call from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. I don't get that call from nobody. So I don't know. All I can do is be in the market 365 days a year. So whether I get the call or not, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. No matter what you want to do, I'm going to build wealth. You want to you reduce interest rates, I'm going to build wealth. If you want to increase interest rates, I'm going to build wealth. Either way, I build wealth. Either way, I get rich. Either way, guys. 
See, this is what I keep telling y'all. If you're in the market 365 days a year and you're constantly putting money in, you get rich either way. Either way. All you got to do is have a long enough time period in there. You get rich either way. So I don't lose any sleep about the stock market crashing or the stock market doing this or doing that. I don't lose any sleep because I know history tells me as long as I'm in that market 365 days a year, boom, I'm Gucci, right? I'm Gucci. I am Gucci. So that's what your big boy, tier one, largest bank in America, fifth largest bank in the world, CEO Jamie Dimon is warning. He is warning, be on the lookout. Rates might go to 8% which may trigger a recession. He's telling his shareholders this. So he's telling them, position yourself. Be ahead of this thing, just in case, right? Smart guy, billionaire. Whether you like him or not, you gotta give him kudos. He heads the largest bank in the United States, fifth largest in the world. Come on, man. And he's a billionaire. I don't know. I'd rather listen to this guy than I ain't gonna even go there. But yeah. All right. Let's round this thing and close this thing up with our daily dose of crypto. Gotta give you your daily dose because I know about 5% of y'all come for the crypto. Come for the crypto. So the 5% of y'all that come for the crypto, here we go. Headline. 21 billion Bitcoin fund on pace to run dry in three months. <laughs> this just, boy, y'all cannot make this crap up. I cannot make this up, man. I cannot make this up. Grayscale, spot Bitcoin exchange traded fund, which holds 21.9 billion in assets under management is on a pace to run dry in the next three months if investors continue their pace of outflows, according to a new report from Decrypt. So what are outflows and inflows? Inflows would be people putting money in the fund. Outflows would be people wanting their money out of the fund. The question you got to ask yourself is why are they taking their money out the fund? Help me out here, guys. I'm talking to you crypto guys. Why are they taking money out of the fund? If it's such a home run, it's such a huge winner. Why in the world are you got more outflows than inflows? I don't know. Let's keep reading. Maybe they'll tell us. Grayscale's GBTC, which converted from a trust into a ETF product in early January, has seen an average of 5,092, 5,092 Bitcoin leave its fund every day. Why? Does that, do you think they got anything to do with some... <laughs> Maybe they smell it. Dump coming? Maybe these people smell a dump coming. Maybe they smell a dump nearby. You know dumps are pretty smelly. You can smell them a mile away, right? Dude, what's that smell? That smells like a dump. I better get my money out of here. I'm just telling you. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Analysts have suggested that investors are exiting GBTC, so they can move funds to rivals in the Bitcoin ETF space that offer lower fees. Hmm. Notably, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, which has been significant growth in iShares Bitcoin Trust ETF, including as much as $10 billion worth of new Bitcoin in a single day. Hmm. So maybe... Grayscale, a little greedy. Maybe they're charging a higher expense ratio. People have gotten wind of that. And they're saying, nah, we're going to go over here to BlackRock. 
lower expense ratio, and maybe that's what's happening. I, I don't know. If G BTC's trend of outflows continues, the fund may no longer have any Bitcoin holdings as of July 8th. Since March 2009, the Grayscale ETF has logged more than 15 billion in outflows. The biggest hemorrhaging of any ETF in the country. At the moment, the Grayscale Fund holds more than 365,000 Bitcoin, valued at about 21.9 billion, according to its website. That marks a decrease of more than 289,900 Bitcoin from the 618,000 Bitcoin it had at the beginning of the year per decrypt. Wow. Isn't that something? Woo. That must not be very good on the grayscale side because they're starting to miss a lot of fees. You go from 618 Bitcoin down to half of that in three months. I think people are just starting to say, you know something? I'm getting out of this thing before the dump happens. Because I think most logical people know that there's a dump coming. And it's not something that you just want to be a part of. You'd rather just make your money and get on out of it. Now, there very well could be people leaving grayscale and going over to BlackRock if the, the expense ratios are lower. That, that, that may be true. That, that, that's not a bad move. But I think people are getting out because they can smell the dump. <laughs> they can... They can smell that dump coming. They can smell that dump a mile away because it's coming. I don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. It's coming. So, so protect yourself. If you guys are out here heavy, 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 heavy in Bitcoin, you're a heavyweight in Bitcoin, please protect yourself. Please protect yourself and, 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 and calculate what you're trying to get accomplished. And if you've accomplished it, you may want to diversify I'm not saying you have to, but you may want to consider diversifying if you have accomplished uh, what you set out to accomplish. Um, just, just consider that because you, you do not want to get caught um, in a situation where you, 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 you're at the bottom of the dump. You, you, I mean, you bought, at the, you, you bought at, the, the, at the pump. You bought at the height of the pump. But you rode that thing all the way down to the bottom of the dump. You, that's not a good feeling. So be careful that you don't get caught with your pants down. Evaluate your position in Bitcoin. If you made your money, get your butt out of it and put it in some traditional assets that are, are more stable, less volatile. If you've made your money, don't get greedy. See, a lot of us get greedy. We get greedy. Now, you done made you some money in Bitcoin. You done made you five grand. You done made you 10 grand. Oh, no, I'm going to stay in because I'm going to a million. <laughs> I'm going to stay in because I'm going to a million. <laughs> I'm in diamond hands. I'm a hodl. Whatever y'all little technology or terminology y'all use in Bitcoin. I'm a hodl. I'm a, I'm a diamond hand. <laughs> I'm a hold to a million. Now, you made you five or 10 grand, man. Get on out. Five or 10 grand, 15 grand, get on out, man. Put it in something less volatile. Uh, okay, we're going to end this thing with a little bit on um, the stock market, just a little, little quick stock market hit and, and daily dose of the stock market, and then we're going to end things. Wall Street ends flat as investors await CPI earnings. CPI and the earnings uh, reports. So y'all know tomorrow is what? Big day. Big day tomorrow. Big day tomorrow, CPI inflation report for March. Big day. Big day tomorrow for us as investors. We need to get a good read on what's going on with inflation. Hopefully, we get a really, really good CPI inflation report for March that says inflation. I, I, I hope we get headline under 3%. Let's say headline at 2.9, 2.8. And if we can get, if we can get core. Let's say we get core at 3.5 and get headline to 2829. Ooh, that'd be a great report for us, right? So that's what the market is positioning themselves for. 
when I looked at uh, the three major indexes today, they were all trading basically sideways, nothing, nothing major happening. Um, yeah, so, so that's the big thing tomorrow. Um, U.S. stocks were essentially unchanged at the close of a choppy session on Monday, which was yesterday, with a solar eclipse offering distraction ahead of the critical, crucial, critical inflation data and the kickoff of the first quarter earnings season. So you got a lot of companies, big boy companies, coming out with their earnings for the first quarter of 2024. So be on the lookout for that. And then obviously you got that CPI inflation report coming out tomorrow. So the S&P and the Dow posted minimal losses while the NASDAQ ended, while the NASDAQ ended nominally higher. All three were held in check by the highest benchmark U.S. Treasury yields since November. So like I said, guys, as these investors start losing faith in the Fed reducing rates, which they are losing faith fast, as investors, big boy, blue chip, Wall Street, hedge funds, billionaires lose faith that the Fed is going to reduce these interest rates, they're taking profits out of the stock market. They're selling positions, taking profits. Remember, they had a, a wonderful first quarter. S&P was up 10%. Magnificent 7 was up 17%. So they had a wonderful first quarter, but they left money in because they were anticipating rates coming down and even do more wonderful. Now, it doesn't seem like rates will come down as fast as they think. So a lot of these big boys are taking their money out of the stock market and doing what with it? Moving it to treasuries. So now you see a little bit of uplift in treasuries as excitement, enthusiasm decreases that Fed will reduce rates. So that's kind of my little take on it, kind of what's happening. That report highlighted chances that the Fed Reserve could delay implementing its first interest rate cut at its monthly federal open market committee meetings longer than previously expected. Wall Street is adjusting expectations to reflect the fact that the Fed could slower to lower interest rates, that now the greatest likelihood is for a rate cut to occur at the July FOMC meeting rather than June. See what I'm saying? It just keep going, getting pushed back, right? It keeps getting pushed back. The more it gets pushed back, guys, the more you will see big boy, big time blue chip investors start shifting away from the market and put money in safety till they have better clarity on when rates are coming down. Now, that's a good opportunity for you and I to continue dollar cost averaging in. Because as, as the market goes lower over these next few months, we dollar cost average in, we will continue to buy these assets at a discount. And then when the Fed does start lowering, those assets will go back up in value. Why will they go back up in value? Because these big boy blue chip investors, they will come back. And that will do what? FOMO will come back. And then that's when it'll go, it'll start going back up. But, but in these next three months, we just continue buying. Even if we're buying the dip slightly, it's okay. We know the assets are coming back because they've already been where we know they can go again. I don't care if the S&P 500 goes back to 4,900 points. That doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me if it goes to 4,800 points. It doesn't bother me if it goes to 4,500 points. It's already gotten to 52, so I know it'll do it again. That's just a great opportunity for me to buy the dip through my dollar cost averaging and through my reserve cash. So don't, don't worry about Oh, golly, what's happening? It's, it's, it's terrible. No, it's not. It's not terrible. If you're, if you're in the building stage of, way, the building stage of wealth, it's, it's fantastic. On Wednesday, the Labor Department's March Consumer Price Index report is expected to show a slight cool down in monthly price growth and a nominal decrease in the annual core number, which excludes volatile food and energy. Now, that's what they're saying. We, we were headed to a good report. I'm hoping. It's probably a better day to watch the eclipse than it is to trade stocks. Okay, whatever. 
Okay, so there we go. So now they give a year-over-year -year headline is expected to gain some heat, rise into 3.4. Oh, God, not 3.4. Okay, well, we'll see tomorrow. I'm not going to speculate. We'll just see tomorrow. We will see tomorrow. Oh, I do want to tell y'all one thing that this Fed governor said. Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago president said on Monday that the central bank must take into consideration how long it can maintain its restrictive policy without damaging the economy. Basically, what he's saying there is, is they got to be careful. You can't keep rates high for longer too long. And all of a sudden you start a domino effect and then we go into a recession. That's what he's basically saying. Got to be careful with that. Got to be. That has to be in the forefront of their mind. When I heard Coolsby was speaking at one, I was relieved because I know he's dove. And that basically means he wants to be less restricted. He wants to bring, bring, bring rates down. Uh, keeping rates higher for longer and, 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 and being hard-nosed would be hawkish. This guy is dovish. He wants to bring them down. Hawkish would mean keep them up, keep them for longer. That's hawkish. Dovish, this guy's on the dovish side. He wants to see rates come down. So there was no need to worry about the market melting down while everyone is looking at the sun. Okay, I, I didn't know, know was it was a lunar eclipse. I, I don't pay any attention to that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, guys, that's where we're at on a Tuesday morning in our economy. What's going on with the American people and their money? What's going on with your daily dose of crypto? What's going on with your daily dose of the stock market? There you go. All you got to do today is think about what we talked about and apply it to your financial life. Do something. Do something to get yourself one step closer to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's what you should be asking yourself every night before you close your eyes. Did I do everything I needed to do today to get me one step closer to my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? And be honest with yourself. If you did, kudos. If you didn't, strategize. This is what I'm going to do different tomorrow to get back on track. You should be doing that every single day. Every single day you should be doing that, right? If you want to get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Y'all know I will be back here again tomorrow, 1030 a.m. Eastern time with another live stream. This live stream does turn into a regular video. So if you want to go back and catch some things that you missed or you, you, you popped in late, go check it out in its video format on the YouTube channel. If you want those seven free stocks from Moomoo, you got to get down to the description box. You got to click on the Moomoo link. You got to open up your Moomoo account. You got to put $100 in it and they're going to give you seven free stocks, specifically the Magnificent Seven fractional share stocks. They're going to give you seven fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. How are you going to beat that? You got the top seven companies in the S&P 500. Three of the top companies from a market cap value in the world. Three of them. Three of them in the world. I'm talking about Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. They're going to give you fractional shares. How are you going to beat that, man? Fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven for putting $100 in your new Moo Moo account. So if you want that, you want to be a part of the movement, you want to rock with me, use the same brokerage app I'm using, get down to the description box, click on that Moo Moo link. Also be on the lookout for the website, which is coming at the end of this week, hopefully, fingers crossed, more on that to come. Also, if you want to follow me on Instagram, get down to the description box of the video, click on that Instagram link, Richard Fang Millionaire Mentor, Get over to Instagram, give me a follow, and then send me a DM and say, hello, man, how you doing? And let's chop it up. I got to get my Instagram game up. Need y'all to help me get my Instagram game up. Remember, I had a 90,000 follower Instagram page and got it shut down. I'm starting from scratch. Need y'all to get over to the Instagram. Give your boy a follow on the gram. Get down to the description box. Click on that Instagram link and give me a follow I really appreciate it. Guys, I appreciate y'all rocking with me today. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you will apply what you learned and build some wealth. I'm here to help you every single day. 
365 days a year, I'm going to be pushing out this content, and I hope y'all join me. I hope you keep rocking with me, because I'm going to keep rocking with you. Thoughts become things. Oh, before you get out of here, hit that thumbs up, guys. Hit that thumbs up before you get out of here. I appreciate y'all that have hit the thumbs up, but before you click out, hit the thumbs up for me. Let's get this thing in the algorithm so we can get it out to more people. Hit that thumbs up. That really does help. It also lets me know you appreciate what I'm doing every single day to help you guys get to your financial freedom. So if you don't mind, hit that thumbs up for me before you get out of here. Thoughts become things. You can see it in your mind. You can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy. Get wealthy. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.